Welcome to the 700 Club. Republican senators say President Biden is sending mixed messages regarding Israel. The president says his administration stands with the Jewish state. So the question is, why is it sending millions in U.S. tax dollars to UNRWA, a group linked to incitement and to terrorism? The 14 senators have sent a letter to the president encouraging him to stand firm with Israel. Abigail Robertson takes a closer look at the specific policies these Republicans find so repulsive. Senator James Langford says when it comes to U.S. support for Israel, the Biden administration is sending mixed messages. And he argues we need to reaffirm our commitment rather than distancing ourselves. We stand with Israel, their ally and America is opposed to terrorism. One concern is the Biden administration's decision to reopen a Palestinian consulate in Jerusalem. That's an important way for, uh, for our country to engage with and provide support uh, to the uh, Palestinian people. Langford argues it sends the wrong message. Our embassy is in Jerusalem. Uh, that's the focus there. Obviously, the Jewish state is their main headquarters, their Knesset. All their leadership offices are in Jerusalem. That should be a focus. So I have real concern that sends a mixed message uh, from the United States. Add to that message plans to reopen a PLO mission here in Washington. Langford worries that could potentially have a negative impact on fighting terror. So I've worked very hard to be able to allow victims of terrorism that are Americans to also hold Palestinian leadership accountable in American courts. And the connection there is if they base uh, any of the Palestinian um, efforts here in the United States and have a headquarters here in the United States, American families are able to sue Palestinians uh, for uh, damages and for loss uh, for the acts of terrorism that have been carried out against some of these families. Langford fears the administration is trying to find a way around that. And definitely shouldn't send a mixed message to American families that are victims of terrorism that they're not going to be able to get their day in court. Secretary of State Blinken also recently announced 30 million in U.S. tax dollars will go to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees. I do not believe we should have restored the funding to that U.N. organization that handles refugees. They handle refugees in the Palestinian areas different than they handle refugees anywhere else in the world. Even Blinken recently acknowledged the U.N. group spreads anti-Semitic education materials, erasing Israel from maps. We need to make sure the schools are actually not teaching hatred and bigotry to the next generation. And Langford argues the group is not working to resettle the Palestinian refugees. And the U.N. will not allow the Palestinians to be able to integrate in other areas because the theory is that they're going to move back to Israel and they're going to take over Israel in the future. That's absurd. Uh, their, their focus there is to be able to drive the Jews out of Israel and have that not be a Jewish state anymore. That's not going to happen and should not happen. Uh, but that U.N. organization seems to be focused on that issue. The Biden administration, however, insists support for Israel is strong. Our uh, stalwart support, our ironclad uh, support for uh, Israel uh, will remain. Republicans are also concerned with the Biden administration's plans to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal, arguing Iran is funding terrorist enemies of Israel like Hamas and Hezbollah. Reporting from Virginia, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, there's a lot to unpack on this one. Uh, and just to make it plain, your tax dollars under the Biden administration are going back into UNRWA. What UNRWA does is, and they've been doing it now since 1948, is continue to pay Palestinians to stay in refugee camps on the hopes that one day they will return uh, to, to take over the land that is now called Israel. Um, that's the whole purpose of UNRWA. And uh, the Trump administration finally recognized, it should have been recognized decades ago, that this is nonsense and this should never happen and we shouldn't have financial incentives for people to stay in refugee status. Uh, they need to get on with their life. And they need to do that not just for their own sakes, but for their children and their grandchildren. We now have five generations that are living in refugee camps, and it's time for all of that to stop. Uh, this so-called right of return uh, is just flat nonsense. Israel's not going away. And 
Uh, the Arabs had their shot at it, and they certainly took their shot. Uh, going back to 1948, where five Arab nations declared war against the state of Israel on the day that the state of Israel was established. Well, they lost that war, and they've lost every war since. Uh, and it's time to recognize that this isn't going to happen. So why are you and I paying for it is a real big question. Um, uh, Trump recognized this is not a good deal for the American taxpayer. Uh, I, I hope the current administration wakes up to it. Because what is UNRWA really doing? Well, they're paying for textbooks that have incitement. Uh, there have been reports that some UNRWA money has uh, somehow gone to other groups that have uh, very nefarious intent towards I Israel. So how do, we, how do we deal with this? Well, you stop it at the source and you say, no more. Um, and I urge the administration, please rethink this. There's, there's no point in continuing to fund refugee status for these camps. In other news, top Democrats have rebuked one of the me members over her comments comparing the United States and Israel with terrorist group. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim. Gordon, Minnesota Congresswoman Ilan Omar ignited a political storm when she tweeted a message that included this statement. We have seen unthinkable atrocities committed by the U.S., Hamas, Israel, Afghanistan, and the Taliban. Twelve Democrats, led by Brad Schneider, denounced her tweet, saying, equating the United States and Israel to Hamas and the Taliban is as offensive as it is misguided. Omar criticized her colleagues, accusing them of using Islamic tropes. Some left-wing colleagues supported her. But Thursday, she backed away, saying, I was in no way equating terrorist organizations with democratic countries with well-established judicial systems. Even so, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the other five top House Democrats issued a statement making it clear they disapprove of Omar's original remarks. As more Americans venture out to shop, dine, and travel, they're being met with higher prices caused by inflation for a wide variety of products. So what does this mean for your wallet, and how long will this last? Jennifer Wishon takes a look. Unlike a year ago, it's likely your supermarket is fully stocked with toilet paper. That's a relief. But now, it's costing you more. Kimberly Clark, which makes Kleenex and Scott toilet paper, says it's raising the price on 60% of its products. Procter & Gamble is hiking prices on baby, feminine, and adult care lines. Overall, consumers are paying 5% more over the past year, with raw materials needed to make common items costing more, and as supply struggles to meet demand in the rapidly reopening economy. Price of chicken's gone up like 40%. On the grocery aisles, General Mills is considering raising prices to cover increased cost of grain and sugar. Skippy peanut butter cost more. Coca-Cola plans to raise prices too. We had expected some volatility and in inflation early in the year uh, versus last year, and that's what we're seeing. The service industry is also struggling to keep up with vigorous new consumer demand. Airline fares rose 7% last month after jumping more than 10% in April. Restaurants are marking up prices, too, to make up for higher wages they're now paying to keep or attract workers. Consumers are spending more rapidly than businesses can reopen or ramp up and hire up. As long as that's going on, that makes it hard for prices to abate. Fed officials maintain inflation is temporary and will drop off after supply rises to meet demand. Other economists predict we're currently at the peak of inflation and can expect it to start to recede as soon as next month. Some economists fear inflation could remain higher for a longer period of time than officials expect, but for now, most don't believe that's likely. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Returning overseas now, the annual Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast is mobilizing Christians around the world to both pray for and stand with the nation of Israel. Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast exists to call the nations, decision makers, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to unite their efforts to uh, bring their embassies to uh, Jerusalem. The three-day event was held just weeks after an 11-day war with Hamas and an unprecedented surge of worldwide anti-Semitism. 
is Israel's president-elect, Isaac Herzog, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, members of Congress, governors, and other leaders around the world addressed the delegates. And the president of Honduras made a special announcement. My mission will be to officially inaugurate the opening of the embassy of Honduras in the eternal capital of Israel, the city of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem prayer breakfast began in 2017 and reaches worldwide. And Vexler believes a major blessing can come to the nations of the world when they recognize the simple truths of the Bible. And I'd say those blessings can come to individuals as well when we recognize those truths. Gordon? Those who bless you will be blessed. That's a promise that goes back to Genesis. That's a promise that God made to Abraham. Uh, let's continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We've seen the rocket attacks. We've seen the terror attacks. We've seen the political turmoil that's currently in Israel, uh, the struggle to form a new government. All of these things need to be prayed over. So let's ask God for the peace of Jerusalem. Well, racial tension has certainly risen in America after several police shootings involving black men. The ongoing tension has given rise to a new black militia. Who are they? What's their purpose? And why are they heavily armed? Eric Phelps talked with a group's supreme commander to find out. Even with three guilty verdicts against the officer charged in George Floyd's death, some say black Americans still feel threatened. In fact, black gun ownership is up 60%, according to the National Shooting Sports Foundation, and some say that's in response to continued violence against that community. Another response, a new black militia group. I sat down with its founder to find out why he started the group, which is growing in numbers and popularity. I have a very hard time explaining to my child um, about the, the bygone era of lynching, when there's suspicion that a lynching just happened. But when we start seeing the Ahmaud Arbery case, where white men hunted down, a black man and, and killed him. John Johnson, better known by his former DJ name, Grandmaster J, is the supreme commander of the NFAC, the Not Effing Around Coalition, a black militia. We're not having the lies. We're not having the unequal administration of justice anymore. We're not having existing under the conditions that have been set by another race that do nothing but hamstring us and are detrimental to our very existence. We're not having it anymore. I didn't form the group. The group was formed out of necessity based on the environment and the pressures being exacted upon the black population. Founded in 2020, Johnson claims the NFAC has become a global force, helping push the investigations into the killings of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. DePaul University professor Thomas Mikatis told NBC News that the NFAC is different from far-right militias, some of whom were involved in the Capitol insurrection. They have not risen to the level of concern of, say, the three percenters, the Oath Keepers. They have not engaged in violence. In fact, in most of their pre of their demonstrations, they have in fact coordinated their activities with police. CBN News asked the FBI about the NFAC. Officials responded that they have no comment, adding that the FBI does not investigate groups and that their investigations focus solely on criminal activity. What is the necessity to be heavily armed as the group is? What do you mean, why the guns? Why not? Everyone else has guns. This country was born out of revolution. We fought over slavery with guns. As a matter of fact, they left the British with guns. As a matter of fact, when the police show up, the first thing they pull out is a gun. According to Johnson, his group has a few main goals, to protect and police the black community, to underscore the right of black Americans to bear arms. On the backbone of a military force that would facilitate the exodus from this country of those willing to go somewhere to establish an ethno-nation uh, that's based totally on our culture, gives us the ability to determine our path so that we too can have a seat at the international table like every other race on this planet. Police officers are killing black people with impunity and it doesn't seem like this kind of violence is going to abate unless, of course, Black folk do something 
to bring about its end. Dr. Judson Jeffries is professor of African-American studies at The Ohio State University. So that police understand that, hey, listen, there could be a consequence if I go into black communities and misbehave. That's missing. That's why I think a group like the NFAC is um, very important these days. After the officer who placed a knee on George Floyd's neck was found guilty of murder, Johnson shared this observation with me by phone. Ever since the verdict, there has been a perception of an uptick in law enforcement shootings, Johnson said, which is an expectation because of our relationship between police and culture, or what I call police backlash. Andrew Brown, Micaiah Bryant, Dante Wright, Adam Toledo, all black, all shot to death by police in the weeks surrounding the verdict. Johnson said, I find these all to be tragedies. The gun has become the judge, jury, and executioners on American streets. Community policing could have stopped Micaiah Bryant from being shot. Community policing could have saved Dante Wright's life. But that's why the NFAC has emerged, Johnson says, to try to give justice a nudge. And while 18-year-olds can join up, the NFAC is built on a military structure and tends to target mature members in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, some of them veterans. Johnson says there's also extensive training. There is uh, one state commander in every state, and then there are chapters with chapter command. I sit at the top of that pyramid as the Supreme Command. There are background checks. There are criminal checks. In fact, has a zero record of arrest. We have a zero record of property destruction. We have a zero record of anyone shooting anyone. We have not been, a, we, we have a zero record of violence. Those words spoken before Johnson himself was arrested and federally indicted for allegedly pointing an AR platform rifle at an FBI agent and other law enforcement officers during a Breonna Taylor protest, something he aggressively denies, asserting he was targeted because of who he is. Still, that has not taken the steam out of the NFAC's mission. This group is basically saying, listen, uh, we're exercising our Second Amend Amendment right with the express purpose of protecting black folks from the indiscriminate violence um, by police officers, especially white police officers, who come into our communities and snuff up black lives um, prematurely. We're not anti-Semitic. We're not a hate group. We're not terrorists. Uh, we are the response to the continued repeated injustice against our people. We're not left. And we're not right. We are what we said we are. While Johnson says the group is not political, he himself ran for president back in 2016 as an independent candidate. He says this movement is about justice and not revenge. The key being justice operates within the confines of the law. And he says he insists on the NFAC being a law-abiding organization. In Washington, Eric Phillips, CBN News. I wanted to bring you this story to show you what's happening and what's happening with NFAC, what's happening with John Johnson and, and their, their viewpoint. And we have to listen carefully to what he's saying. Uh, the formation of this group is in response to what we're perceiving in our culture. But behind him, and, and I think uh, let's look past uh, what, what he's doing, what he's saying he's doing, and, and uh, look at some ideology that's currently coming out in our culture. Behind John Johnson was a picture, and, and that picture was of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And you go back to the 1960s and the, the dichotomy, if you will, between Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, emphasizing peaceful protest, emphasizing the need to organize, uh, the need to exercise our political rights, uh, in order to obtain liberty, uh, in order to pass civil rights legislation, um, that Malcolm X had a completely different view, and his view was by any means necessary. So within that um, dichotomy of opinion, there, there was a real broad spectrum, and you know, everything from Black Panthers to, uh, you know, we shall overcome and locking arms together and marching peacefully to, through the streets. Uh, I would challenge which is more effective and submit that Martin Luther King had a much better idea and what he learned and, and what he studied and then what he became 
certainly changed our culture uh, and changed things uh, to, to uh, a much better degree. His, his dream is still unfulfilled, um, but let's have people of goodwill join together uh, to say, how can we change our culture? How can we do things? Um, outside of John Johnson, I want to bring this one to you. This is a psychiatrist who spoke to Yale University School of Medicine uh, back in April. And here is the statement from her lecture. I had fantasies of unloading a revolver into the head of any white person that got in my way, burying their body and wiping my bloody hands as I walked away relatively guiltless with a bounce in my step like I did the world a favor. Now, that is an extreme statement um, in defense of that psychiatrist. Uh, she's now saying she did it intentionally in order to be provocative and, and to start the conversation. Um, but that's actually not a good way to start conversations. Um, that's a good way to incite violence. And uh, we, we can't have this. Uh, look at what's happening in Black Lives Matter, and I'm talking about the overall movement, not the organization. I think the organization is quite clearly a Marxist organization that wants to tear down our culture and our society. They've said that. We need to tear down the white supremacist structure. Uh, but Black Lives Matter as a movement, uh, there's two sides of it. One, uh, that goes into looting and starting fires and uh, blocking off whole blocks of uh, streets and uh, inner cities. Uh, let's take over Portland. Let's take over Seattle. Um, let's burn down federal buildings. And then you have the other side, which is walking peacefully, as they did right here in the city of Norfolk, asking for change. And in that peaceful protest, they were definitely joined by white Americans who said, we have a problem. Uh, let us work together to solve our problem. Let us work together that this isn't an aspiration any longer, but this is real, that we can be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. People of goodwill, please, let's get together to do this. I don't believe anyone should die in police custody. Uh, that shouldn't happen any longer. No one like Aubrey should be hunted down with a pickup truck and shot just because he's jogging through a neighborhood. These things shouldn't happen in America. I don't want that kind of America for my children, for my grandchildren, and I don't want it for me either. Let's join together. Let's make a difference. Let's bring liberty. Let's bring equality. And most of all, let's bring justice to our nation. Well, 1966, that was the year President Lyndon Johnson issued an executive order designating the third Sunday in June as Father's Day. President Richard Nixon signed it into law in 1972. Well, today, Father's Day is celebrated all around the world. So who started this tradition of honoring our fathers? And how was she inspired by a Mother's Day message? Take a look. The greatest gift I ever had came from God. I call him Dad. In those few words, the unknown author captured a truth poets, writers, Philosophers and preachers have been writing about for centuries. Good fathers are indispensable in life and deeply missed when they're gone. In the words of Billy Graham, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. It's likely those very thoughts inspired Sonora Smart Dodd, the young woman who imagined a national Father's Day in honor of her father, William Jackson Smart. A Civil War veteran and father of 12, William suffered personal pain and loss, yet still managed to show Sonora and her siblings the meaning of unconditional, sacrificial love, expecting nothing in return. An 83-year-old Sonora said in a 1965 interview, My own father never accepted Father's Day as personal to himself, but to all fathers, worthy fathers. Today, Betsy Roddy passes down their story. She's Sonora's great-granddaughter and William Smart's great-great-granddaughter and says much of what she knows she heard from Sonora herself. 
I think she viewed him as a dedicated father. Very fact that he went against the norm. The norm would have been upon um, his wife's passing that the young children would have been farmed out to relatives to raise. He didn't do that. Never considered doing it. He was clearly dedicated to family. It simply wasn't a requirement in those days, in that era, for widowers to take on the role that he did, but he did. William's story as a father begins when he took up farming after serving in the Union Army in the Civil War. At war's end in Arkansas, the now 22-year-old Union artillery sergeant married Elizabeth and had three children. 13 years later, his wife died, leaving him to raise his children alone. He went on to marry Ellen, a widow with three children of her own. Their first child together was Sonora, followed by five boys. Now, there were 12. In fact, they all got along and they called themselves steps, halves, and sibs. <laughs> that was the joke in the family. Later, they all moved westward to a soldier's homestead in eastern Washington. But in 1898, 18 years after they married, Ellen died in childbirth. With his six youngest children, Sonora and her five brothers still home, he again put his own pain aside to be there for them. She recalls a story on the night of her mother's funeral that her youngest uh, brother ran out into the night kind of crying and looking for his mom. And her father followed him out there, brought him in, sat by the fire and rocked him to sleep and sang to him. And as she recounts, in that moment, her father became father and mother to their entire very large family. That sense of strength, caring, and protection would carry Sonora's family through many good and bad times for years to come. Then in 1909, Sonora, now a 27-year-old wife and mother living in Spokane, Washington, attended to a Mother's Day service that actually brought her father to mind. She went and talked to her minister afterwards. And said, I love what she said about mothers and Mother's Day. But what about fathers? When do they get their time in the sun? After careful consideration and thought, Sonora called on churches to establish a national Father's Day. Within a year, she had convinced church and government leaders, including the Washington state governor, to set aside every third Sunday of June to celebrate fathers. On June 19, 1910, Presbyterian and Methodist churches throughout Washington observed the first Father's Day. Sonora, of course, went to church that morning, and afterwards, she spent her day delivering Father's Day gifts to elderly shut-ins. By the following year, Father's Day was being observed around the world, and Sonora would have nine more years to celebrate with her father before his death in 1919. Still, it wasn't until 1966, when Sonora was 84, that President Lyndon Johnson issued an executive order designating the third Sunday in June as Father's Day. Six years later, in 1972, it would be signed into law by Richard Nixon, calling on U.S. citizens to offer public and private expressions of such day, the abiding love and gratitude which they bear for their fathers. Shortly after, on her 90th birthday, Sonora received a telegram from President Nixon, thanking her for this great tradition, a day we remember the undeniable need for good fathers in our families, communities, and societies. It was extremely gratifying to her. Imagine she's been working on this since 1910. <laughs> So 62 years later, it really, it becomes real in a very uh, codified sense of the word. And because I think it signaled the level of importance that she always had for this legacy, and not just because of her own father, but for fathers everywhere. She was really dedicated to the idea of, we need to celebrate them. They do a really amazing thing. Well, let's celebrate fathers, uh, let's celebrate mothers, and in that, obey the commandment, honor your mother and your father. And there's a great promise from doing this, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God has given you. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. In Fitchburg, Massachusetts, a graduating high school senior wowed the crowd by asking officials to give her scholarship to another student. Roda Teta won the $40,000 General Excellence Scholarship. She said her Christian faith and her mother, who graduated from community college as an adult, are her inspirations, leading to this surprise announcement. 
I would be so very grateful if administration would be um, would consider giving the general um, excellence scholarship to someone who's going to the community college. Teta came to the U.S. from Ghana as a child. Now she's headed to Harvard and says she is confident other scholarships will cover her expenses there. CBN's Operation Blessing is providing clean water for those who need it. Saul and his family in San Juan, Honduras, have struggled to get clean water for nearly a decade. People had to walk more than a mile to get water, and it was contaminated with bugs, dirt, and animal waste, causing health problems for children. But thanks to its generous partners, Operation Blessing built a state-of-the-art water project. It purifies water from natural sources high up in the mountains and brings it right to the community's doorstep. A grateful Saul said those who gave to the project brought the people there out of a great crisis. And you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Stress, worry, anxiety, dread. If you're experiencing any of these issues, you're not alone. The first step in getting better is what? Asking yourself one simple question. Are you really okay? Deborah Faleta is a professional counselor, speaker, and podcast host. She says we all need to ask ourselves, am I really okay? But just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're healthy. In the craziness and busyness of life, we push through without ever taking inventory of how we're actually doing. She helps us get real about our spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical health and explains why it matters in her new book, Are You Really Okay? Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Deborah Faleta. Deborah, it's good to have you with us today. Oh, it's good to be with you again. You say that most of us are not as healthy as we think we are. If that's true, why do, why do we think we're healthy? Yeah, you know, it's easy for us to say we're healthy. I think social media and the world, we kind of have a tendency to present our best face, you know, snapshots of our perfect life. And sometimes we start believing in that superficial life. We start believing that that's actually true. You know, when we come to Jesus, we don't automatically assume that our cholesterol levels are going to be just right or our BMI is going to be what we need it to be. But we make that assumption with our emotional and mental health. Sometimes we assume that because we come to Jesus, all of those things are going to be okay, not realizing that there's a lot of work to do in order to get to a healthy place. So are you saying then that Christians in particular have a hard time getting real about what's going on in their lives more than other people might? I think so. And I think it's because we're wired to think that, you know, when when we become Christians, that we can't struggle. Um, and specifically in the area of mental and emotional health, I think a lot of times there's been myths that if you struggle with depression or anxiety, that means that you don't have enough faith or you're not strong enough, or maybe that there's even a sin issue in your life. I think sometimes we, we don't realize that becoming emotionally and mentally healthy is kind of like exercising a muscle. You know, it's not gonna be strong on its own. It's something that we have to work out and practice and deal with. You talk about your own struggle with panic attacks in the book. And the people that I know that have struggled with that, one of the issues is they seem to come out of nowhere. So how should people who struggle with this handle a panic attack? You know, panic attacks seem to come out of nowhere, but they never come out of nowhere. There is always a route. And I'm a licensed counselor, but that doesn't mean I'm immune, just like a doctor isn't immune to getting sick. For me, I went through a, a really severe trauma many years ago where I went through a miscarriage and I almost lost my life in the process. I was rushed to emergency surgery. And um, when I got home and started recovering from that traumatic experience, I didn't realize that trauma takes years to heal and, and that healing happens in layers. And so for me, a few years later, that trauma started to come back into my life and impact me in the form of panic attacks. And I didn't know it at the time, but a lot of those emotions and that anxiety was actually rooted in the past trauma that I had experienced. And there's many Christians who have suffered past trauma or past hardships 
and they think that those things are just going to go away with time. But time doesn't heal all wounds. Only Jesus can, and we can partner with him in the process of working through these things and getting healthy from the inside out. You use the word process, so what steps can we take knowing that we might struggle with trauma or anxiety? What steps can we take to get in touch with our real emotions, even so we can put together what you just did for yourself? You know, I had this happen in the past and I'm experiencing this now. How do we reconcile that? You know, we we often go to the doctor for physicals, right? Checkups, we get our mammogram, our annuals, whether or not we want to. But how often do we stop and do an emotional checkup or a mental health checkup? And one thing that I really thought was important to do in this book is after each section on mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, I stop to give you a list of important questions to ask, such as what are the feelings I'm experiencing in my present? Can I name some of the emotions that I'm going through? At one point, I even have you take inventory of all the different stressors in your life and give them a number so that you can get a feel of how you're actually doing. Sometimes that means making a timeline where you go back and and list the different things that you've been through in your past as you start to take inventory of how they might be affecting you in the present. Now, for many people, getting healthy requires going to counseling and working with a licensed counselor to start dealing with some of these things. You know, there's not a one size fits all approach for each person, but it starts with taking the time to stop and ask, how am I really doing in this season of life? But also, you know, there's a stigma attached to that sometimes, especially seeking counseling. And it's not just in the church. I think it's cultural. So how do we work past that? How do, how, how do we become just generally more accepting of getting help when we need it? You know, I like to think of counseling kind of like going to the gym. I think most people see counseling like going to the doctor. They think, you know, I'm sick and in need of a doctor and nobody wants to be sick. No one wants to acknowledge that they're feeling sick. But what if we changed our perspective and started seeing counseling like going to the gym? We're going to work out and exercise our emotional muscles, our mental muscles, our spiritual muscles. I think we would high five each other for going to the gym and taking the time to take care of ourselves. And what if we were to shift our perspective of counseling and start seeing it as the way that we get stronger um, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally? And I think that is God's intention for all of us. The book is really very, very excellent. It's called, Are You Really Okay? Deborah's book is available wherever books are sold. Deborah, great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. Khalifa was devastated when her husband deserted her and their three children. How could she possibly support her family on her own? Well, thankfully, Khalifa found a way, and then COVID hit. So what happened next? Take a look. 33-year-old Khalifa never imagined that her husband would abandon them and leave her to raise their three kids. My children are everything to me. I would do anything so they would have food to eat. But finding food and work was difficult even before the COVID pandemic. That's when CBN's Orphan's Promise helped Khalifa for the first time. We provided her with training on how to run a small business. Then we gave her what she said she needed to get her food stand started. Khalifa said she finally had enough income to feed her children. Then COVID hit and people stayed home. Before COVID, I earned between seven to $11 a day. Then it dropped to $3 a day during the pandemic. During that difficult time, Orphan's Promise helped Khalifa and other hard hit families by providing food packs, including rice and other staples. As the COVID crisis eased and people returned to work, Khalifa said they began to buy from her again. Her income is now double what it was before the pandemic started. I really want to thank the people who support Orphan's Promise. Because of your help, we have gotten through these difficult times. Thank you. I want to say thank you to you as well. You know, there are so many people around the world who are in crisis situations and there is no safety net. 
And yet you allow us to come along and to be there and to make a difference, to see them in their need, to give them a hand up, to encourage them in, in just becoming what they're trying to do, which is survive every day, love their kids. One of the reasons Orphan's Promise does this is so that children don't wind up in orphanages. Half the kids who are in orphanages in the world are not true orphans. They're children who come from poverty. So help us make a difference in the lives. Listen, you can also join the 700 Club and make a difference around the world in many, many ways. And so we're asking you to do that right now. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. We're out there every day and we're here at home working too. And we want you to be a part of that. So will you call our toll free number and join right now? There it is on your screen. 1-800-700-7000. And listen, when you call and join today, we want to send you God is for us. I love this. Verses of salvation, peace, and victory from the book of Romans. It's Pat reading this. And you know, the word of God never returns void. This is going to bless you in your walk with the Lord. And at the same time, you'll know you have the privilege of touching and blessing people like Khalifa and her three children who now have hope and a future because of your generosity. Thank you. Gordon. When Judy got new dentures, she never dreamed they would cause her whole body to ache. She suffered through the pain, couldn't even eat. So how was she healed in an instant? Take a look. My name is Judy. I'm retired. I have great, great grandkids and I enjoy being with my family. I needed a new denture. So on the 1st of July in 2020, I went to an appointment to have dentures made. And I left there and I was so excited and I thought, wow, these feel great. The next day, my gums were hurting. They were starting, had three or four sore spots. They had me come in the next day so that they could make the uh, adjustments again. The pain came back and I was hesitant about making another appointment because when they make adjustments, that um, loosens the dentures. And I, I didn't want my dentures loose to where they would pop out. And I thought, well, I'm gonna kind of suffer through this. The pain on a scale of one to 10 was at least an eight. I couldn't even eat oatmeal. My whole body ached from that tooth pain. I'd have to take my teeth out of my mouth with change. I couldn't speak clearly. It's difficult enjoying grandkids and smiling and having fun with them when you're in pain like that. So those things I could not do. I just simply couldn't do. Thursday, July 13th, I realized I had not taken this to God in prayer. And so I asked God, I said, this pain, I cannot take this. I don't want to have to have this adjusted again. It's going to loosen my teeth and, and, I, and I need you to heal it. I need you to fix it for me. The following Tuesday, I sat down to watch the 700 Club and Terry had a word of knowledge. Someone else you have trouble with uh, um, your mouth, with your teeth, with uh, some kind of dental work that's been given to you that rubs in your mouth the wrong way. God's healing your mouth from all of that. It was for me and I knew it. And I thought, oh, wow. It's going to fit perfectly. You're going to speak perfectly, be able to chew perfectly. The pain was gone. It was gone. Hours before, I couldn't eat dinner because I was in such pain. I clenched my teeth. It was okay. And I knew, I knew that I'd had the healing then. I have a wonderful time with them grands and the greats and the great greats and no, no pain. He healed me 100%. And I've told all of them, they know how great God is. It's so exciting to know my little teeth problem, he took care of for me. He cares about me, he loves me. And he cares about you and he loves you. For God so loved the world, that's you, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that's you again, whosoever, believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Within that salvation comes healing, comes deliverance, comes the answer to every human need. God cares for you. He loves you. He's vitally interested in you. And when you get that, when you understand that, then miracles get to be very easy. We've got another miracle for you. This is Virginia from Great Falls, Montana. She had severe back pain. She depended on her cane just to walk. And then last April, she was watching this show. Terry said, someone else with, back, with a back injury, some kind of accident that you've had, God's healing that for you right now. 
That chronic pain, that shooting pain is just being gone. In Jesus' name, receive your healing. Well, Virginia was able to get out of bed without pain. She no longer needs her cane, and she can't stop rejoicing. Well, neither can Karen, who lives in Gastonia, North Carolina. She was hit in the eye, and it caused trauma. Her eyesight was impaired. She developed glaucoma on just May 11th this year. Before leaving for her third medical appointment, she was watching this program. And Gordon, you said someone else with glaucoma. God's healing her eyes right now. She received that, believed it, went on her way. At the appointment, at her appointment, the doctor confirmed no glaucoma. Let's pray. But before we pray, let's just believe. What do we believe? We believe that Jesus came, that he dwelt among us, that he died on the cross for our sins. He died for our healing. And then he didn't stop there. He rose again on the third day. And right now, he ever lives to give intercession for you. Jesus is praying for you. Let's join with his prayer and let's believe. Lord, we come together. We come together in your name with the anointing, with the forgiveness that you so freely give us. And we come to boldly to that throne of grace, asking for healing. So stretch forth your hand to do miracles, for we ask it in Jesus' name. There's someone you've got severe arthritis in your right hand. It's very difficult for you to make a fist, even close your fingers. God's healing that. You just felt all that pain leave, all that swelling. Do what you couldn't do before. Make that clenched fist right now and realize it's gone and it's never coming back. Terry? Yeah, there's a, a man, you're, you work in the construction business and you have something to do with pouring concrete. You've had an injury at work and you've sustained it for a while. God's healing you today. You're not even asking for it. Jesus Christ is healing your condition. Receive it in Jesus' name. There's someone with a severe neck injury. You're in a brace right now. God's healing every vertebra, every bone. Right now, all the bone fractures are being healed. The little bits of bone are being taken away. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. And someone else, you have polyps in your sinus cavity. You hate this time of year because everything is swollen and you have trouble breathing. Breathe in right now completely freely. God has healed that condition for you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call. Here's a word from Psalms. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. For Terry, for me, for all of us, God bless you. We'll see you next week.